It just started not working this semester. And it was working last week, actually, as you know. It was working perfectly. I didn't need to do anything. And I didn't change anything on my computer. It's amazing how these things just magically not work. Uh, at least you're seeing the slides. I'm not seeing them. Uh, I'm not going to hide the controls because that may make things not so good. <laughs> if I hide the zoom controls, I'm afraid. Okay, maybe I, I cannot even hide the zoom controls. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, let me hide it. Okay. All right, guys. Yeah, we've kind of wasted perfectly. I don't know how many minutes, five minutes. That's good. It was a good break. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, great. Uh, well, welcome to our lecture three. Since we've been talking about dependability of computers, you can see that even the basic computers that we have are not dependable for whatever reason, but somehow we really need to fix this problem, I think. I mean, we have so many problems in the world, but somehow dependability tends to be the biggest issue. And that's going to be one of the things that we're going to discuss in this lecture. So what we're going to do in this lecture is the first half of the lecture, I'm going to talk about some mysteries. We're going to finish that today in the first half of the lecture. Uh, and then in the second half, we're going to talk about labs and FPGAs. Ottobark will uh, give the lecture. Hopefully, he will not have as many computer problems as I do, as I did. He's, he's, he's sitting there. You will see him. Uh, but these are completely unexpected problems. One thing should, if something is working, it should, be, it should continue to work and become better, right? Not become worse. And we don't know the reason at this point. And this is a very simple thing, frankly. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Now let's get started. Uh, this doesn't seem to work. Okay, how am I going to make it work? Okay, at least this is working. How many people attended the seminar? Okay, did you like it? Was it interesting? Some of it was probably quite technical, but I think it's good to stretch your boundaries and stretch your mind uh, whenever you're starting because these folks are doing something very, very interesting. We'll see if it will pan out or not. But this is to remind you that uh, please uh, watch it. And you get extra credit, as I mentioned, right? And this was a seminar. Uh, Sean Lee talked about the Cerebus system, its advantages and disadvantages we discussed. And just to uh, recall, enable you to recall, these are some pictorial cues, things we've discussed. And this is your extra credit assignment. It's due March 15th. You still have plenty of time. I'd recommend doing it. You'll learn something. And again, you're not expected to give a very detailed technical summary of the talk. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in what you learned, basically, as, as you can see. Okay, so this brings me to general purpose versus special purpose systems. Atabak will cover them a little bit also, but I wanted to cover them because we've discussed CPUs, right? These are general purpose systems. They can execute any program, essentially. And these, uh, the Cerebras engine is an example of a special purpose system. It's an application-specific processor, let's say. Remember that it's designed for neural network training, especially. In fact, I, uh, we asked him questions during the seminar. Can it Execute other things, limited capability, clearly, right? You need to be able to map the program somehow, but not uh, you cannot map everything to this. And then there's, other sp there's a spectrum of things. So this is a dichotomy between general purpose and special purpose. And it's good to discuss this. General purpose computers can execute any program, easy to program and use. You can program with many, many languages, for example. On the other hand, the special purpose systems are efficient and high performance for a given program. So they cannot execute many programs. They have a limited set of programs over here, and they're difficult to program and use. In fact, we discussed that in the seminar. One of the questions I asked to Sean was, okay, you talk a lot about hardware, but what about the software? And uh, I, I said that at least as much effort should go into software. And he said that actually more effort goes into software to enable this computer. Right? So clearly uh, there's a trade-off over here. But uh, the, the advantage of special purpose over general purpose is General purpose doesn't get the best performance. It gets good average performance on any program you throw at it, but it doesn't give you the best performance and efficiency on a given program that is important to you. That's why people design special purpose systems because these things are terrible at neural network training, whereas these things are extremely efficient at neural network training, for example. But they're only efficient at neural network training, whereas these things are good at essentially everything you throw at them for some definition of good. It's maybe good enough for your purposes, right? Does that make sense? And this is, I think, very uh, general concept, right? We, we have general purpose and special purpose things in our lives. 
I think of computers as tools. Computers are tools that, that help us. Sometimes that make our lives painful also, as you can see earlier, but they're supposed to be tools that help us achieve some goals, solve problems, and have a better life, right? Uh, and you can see general purpose tools. How many of you have used an adjustable wrench like this? So you probably know what I'm talking about, right? This is general purpose. You can also have a special purpose wrench that looks like this. And it's exactly the same trade-off, right? This is flexible. It can work with any bolt or not. It's easy to use, but it doesn't give you the best fit. If you try a nut, it, you may not be able to fit it best because it's adjustable like this, right? And it doesn't give you the best results or efficiency. Special purpose on the other end is a perfect fit for the nut and bolt it's designed for. And so it's efficient and high performance, but usually they're difficult to use. You need to find the perfect fit first, which wrench do you use? And it's inflexible only for fitting bolts, right? This doesn't work for a bigger bolt or a smaller bolt. So you have to find the fit. That's why you have many, many uh, fixed branches like this. So that's the same trade-off. Uh, general purpose CPUs versus special purpose application specific processors. If you really want many, many special purpose application specific processors, you have to design one for each of those applications, as you can see over here, as people have done with the branches. You can come up with many, many other examples. I think I like this one because it's very clean. Okay. So uh, now let's go back to what we were discussing in the last lecture, which we, we finished at Rovehammer, but I want to talk a little bit more about that. So uh, the goal was of this discussion is uh, I want to give you the goals of this course, basically, so that you can understand how a system works underneath the soft layer layer and how decisions made by the hardware affect the programmer and the software in general. And also, hopefully, you'll be able to make those decisions. So you, you, hopefully, you'll be able to make a decision. I want a general purpose system or a special purpose system. This is a very easy high level, well, easy, very important high level decisions to make, a decision to make, right? If you're a data center operator, for example, and you, you, know, you have some applications and you want to really uh, decide what kind of hardware you should use, even though you're not going to do much with the hardware, somebody else is going to program them, you still need to make the decision. Do I want general purpose systems, special purpose systems? How do I mix and match, et cetera? You really need to understand what's going on basically in the workloads, in the software, as well as the hardware that is supposed to execute them. That's why this is important, basically. It spans all aspects of the stack. So we were talking about mysteries. And uh, remember that I told you I'm not going to talk about Meltdown and Spectre. Hopefully, we'll be able to talk about Finnish Rovehammer and at least talk about memory refresh today. Uh, we'll see if we get to memory performance attacks. It's fascinating. But if, we don't, if you don't get to it, you can either watch the lectures I will point you to or uh, read the slides or do not, none of them, basically. You're not required to do it. These are uh, to, to show you that there are interesting problems uh, uh, to, to solving computing today. Okay, people remember Rohammer, hopefully? Okay, good. I don't need to talk about that again. Uh, but basically, this is the fact that you can predictably induce bit flips in commercial memory chips. And I've already throw, thrown you this article, for example. This, I, I find this fascinating because this is written by software people saying that, forget software, it's not important. People can actually take over your system using physical problems in your computer. And you've seen pictures like this. I will not talk about this because I already talked about this in the last lecture. Uh, and you've seen that this is security implications. Basically, you can get a bit flip in memory and someone can take over your system. It could be a, a mobile phone, for example. Mobile phones are, of course, easier, right? Uh, someone can sneak in a program. You can download a program and they may actually take over your system because it's doing something. It's, it's trying to figure out these bit flips and exploit them. And people have shown that they can do that, actually. Many, many sophisticated techniques. Or if you're running a machine learning uh, inference uh, that's trying to detect pedestrians, for example, in your car, uh, by inducing bit flips in that machine that's trying to detect pedestrians in your self-driving car, you can get a terrible accuracy in your system. So what you think is not a pedestrian might be a pedestrian, right? That's what these folks show. So these, this is how serious these bit flips are. And we should really uh, not ignore them. So we talked about this and we, we, we briefly talked about how do we fix the problem. I want to talk about this a little bit so that you can think about things and maybe you'll come up with some solutions because this is a problem that needs solutions basically today. But uh, importantly, how to find this vulnerability, how to exploit this vulnerability, how to fix this vulnerability really requires a strong understanding across the transformation layers, across the stack basically. Because Rohammer is a problem that affects uh, even though it's a device level problem, circuit level problem, it affects the software at the higher level. So you may actually come up with solutions at different layers. 
So we briefly discussed we, we had different slides, uh, the roll hammer solutions that need to be uh, uh, provided, right? If your chips are vulnerable in the field, you have to solve this problem somehow, right? How do you protect the vulnerable DRAM chips in the field? There are limited possibilities here. Uh, so what's, what people have done is to increase the refresh rate. We're going to talk, talk about memory refresh in the next part of this lecture. But memory needs to be refreshed periodically. If you increase that refresh rate, you reduce the probability of a bit flip because you refresh the memory contents more frequently, right? So uh, row hammer cannot happen as easily as before. So for example, Apple, I don't have the picture over here, but Apple introduced a solution uh, that increases the refresh rate. And they were nice enough to reference that led to uh, their solution in the end. Clearly, that's not a good solution, right? You don't want to keep refreshing your memory. We'll talk about what goes into refreshing memory in the next part of this lecture. Uh, but you don't want to expand energy to keep the contents alive because every refresh expands energy. Every refresh leads to performance loss. So you have limited possibilities because you cannot change the hardware in the field, at least today. The hardware is fixed. It's not configurable. You can configure it in a very limited manner by changing the refresh rate, for example. Okay, but longer term, how do you protect the future chips that will have these issues? It's actually, very, very interesting. There are many wider range of protection mechanisms, which I'm not going to go into details. You can think about it. Actually, after the lecture last time, one of, uh, one of your colleagues mentioned one of, the one of the potential solutions. If you're hammering this row and there are rows around it, uh, and, and the rows around it gets, uh, let's say, disturbed, affected, why not just not allocate stuff into those rows that are vulnerable? Basically, isolate the rows a little bit from each other so that you don't allocate things uh, uh, as, uh, as densely in memory. And this is, a, this is a solution that was proposed, actually. It's a software solution that can be employed also. Uh, but the difficulty is it wastes a lot of memory. So there, is always a trade, there are always trade-offs between solutions. And, I mean, we, we already discussed, well, we didn't discuss that much, but I think we already discussed, actually, one of the solutions that we have proposed were employed in Intel chips. Uh, but... Current solutions are not actually employed in the best ways, let's say. Okay, so this is just to give you an idea. Uh, so the bit flips are happening at the device level, right? The device, uh, the memory bits are flipping, they're changing. You stored one, you get a zero later. And this is clearly bad, right? And this affects everything over here that you do. You cannot really trust your hardware anymore. Even if you store one, you cannot say, oh, the data that I'm going to get after storing a value of one is not one anymore. Right. So you cannot trust anything uh, downstream. So how do you fix the problem? So this problem needs to be fixed. It's not just a security problem. It's also a reliability problem. Right? So this is a busy slide where uh, this is to show you that people are actually thinking about a lot of solutions to this problem. How do you actually, for example, design more robust DRAM chips? Can you, can you use error correcting codes to solve the problem? We mentioned this briefly. Uh, add some redundancy to your data. So I said, if a bit flips, you'll detect it somehow. Remember, we talked about hamming, right? Hamming distance. You can use the concept of hamming distance, for example, to build error correcting codes. You can increase the refresh rate, for example, as we discussed. You can put physical isolation. I mentioned this. You may have an aggressor row. You can think of every aggressor row as an aggressor row. Every row is an aggressor row and always isolate. Put, put some distance between rows that you allocate in memory. And this way, you can actually reduce the vulnerability, but there are problems with it because you waste a lot of memory, for example. You can reactively refresh. This is the solution that we propose that's employed. You don't need to know the details of it, but you can think about it. This is just to lure you into, the to into topics similar to this, for example. Or you can reduce the access rate to memory. Basically, you can, you can say, oh, if you can somehow detect somebody is doing row hammer, basically. You keep attacking. Uh, you keep hammering a row. And something in the system, memory controller or software, detects this and says, oh, stop. I'm not going to let you access memory this fast anymore because you may be destroying some data. right? So this sort of detection and uh, uh, um, this is called throttling. You throttle the uh, workload that's really uh, inducing a lot of memory accesses. This sort of uh, throttling can be actually very useful as well. Any thoughts? Anybody? Maybe you have a different kinds of solution. These are the general solution approaches. I went through this really fast. Again, you don't need to understand everything because we're just beginning the course. You may actually understand this a lot more at the end of the course, but this is important for the, because we're going to come back to Road hammer at when we cover virtual memory. Anybody? Thoughts? Solutions? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. 
So that's a that's a great uh, great question. Basically, basically, uh, you know more than maybe some of your colleagues. Don't worry about that. Uh, DRAM is a technology that stores capacitors. Capacitor has charge. And that uh, capacitor leaks charge, that's why it needs to be refreshed. You're going to see this at the uh, next part of the lecture. Uh, if you replace that capacitor with something not leaking, for example, that doesn't uh, lose its value, can that get rid of a problem? And that's a good question, basically. Can some other memory technology? Because getting rid of a capacitor in DRAM is essentially building another memory technology. And other memory technologies exist. They're called, some of them are called resistive memory technologies. They don't have capacitors, for example. They don't have as much leakage, so you're right. But this problem is not just due to leakage also. So uh, this problem was, was shown, at least theoretically, to also happen in some other memory technologies because cells are too close to each other and they affect their operation. But it may mitigate some of the problem, yes. So that's a very good, uh, uh, I, I like that you contributed because this is a different way of thinking, right? You, uh, you need to maybe think about the problem differently. Can I actually move to another technology that doesn't have potential downsides? Can it fix the problem? And maybe we don't know that technology fully yet today, though. Yes, there's one more. OK, that's a difficult one. Can it cancels itself out? I don't know how to do that. It's, it's difficult. Uh, uh, you can isolate the wires better from each other, uh, getting rid of the interference. It's similar to this, let's say, isolation row solution right? at the software level. You can do it at the hardware level also. But again, uh, you lose. that's the downside. Yes. Okay, that's great. <laughs> uh, maybe you should talk to Girai over there who looks at the relationship of voltage and row hammer. Uh, potentially, that could be a solution, but this is not a, this is not a problem with just voltages. DM actually operates at relatively low voltages compared to, for example, flash memory. And the, the issue is uh, maybe if you go to extremely low voltages, you can eliminate this, but we don't know how to do that yet at this point. Uh, but any memory technology that we develop, whether it's operating at high voltage or low voltage in today's range of voltages, has this sort of problem. It's called read disturb in general. And flash memory also has this problem, except it's not as bad in flash memory because you already have intelligent controllers that can solve this in your SSDs. Okay, very good. One more. I'll take last one. Yes, please. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, basically you copy the data somewhere else, right? And then it doesn't have that problem. Yeah, yeah, I see. I see. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a solution that has been proposed also by, by folks. Uh, of course, it has overheads of copying the data, right? So if you need to do this copying very frequently, it becomes a big performance overhead. But yeah, it makes sense. Okay, there's, I'll, I'll give you, uh, maybe you go because you've already talked. Excellent. So that's, that's along the lines of error correcting codes, basically. Can you somehow use a hash function? You could do that, uh, but again, all of these come at cost uh, as well because you need to evaluate the hash function. You need to see whether it changed. You need to figure out how often you need to do that. So that's a possibility. Error correcting codes operate along those lines, let's say. Okay, I'll take one last one, and then we should move on probably. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I think that's similar to the uh, solution that your colleague in the back proposed. Uh -huh. I see without detecting. Yeah, but again, it's uh, yeah. I see what you mean. You keep moving the data around so that you you're not vulnerable. Let's say, the downside is again moving the data around is very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Because in order to move the data around, you really need to uh, copy an entire row, which is eight kilobytes, and then write it somewhere. And then when you write it somewhere, what happens to the data that you wrote, right? You have that problem also. You may start swapping, but yeah, it becomes very heavy in terms of overheads. Now, people propose moving data around inside the DRAM chip much more efficiently. Like we have some work on that without going through the memory control. That can reduce the problem. But again, you're still moving the data around. And moving data around is in general, uh, one of the most costly things that we do in our systems today. But it's great. I think uh, you guys have <laughs> proposed a lot of solutions. And this is tricky because every solution has 
to be evaluated in terms of cost, power, performance, and complexity. And there's no perfect solution to this problem, basically. Okay, so it's great that we had this discussion. If you're really interested, you can certainly look at our first detailed study, our source code, and then Google improved our source code uh, to make it better. Uh, and later, other people improved that source code to make it even better, basically. So this was our paper that introduced the problem eight years ago. The problem is still not solved, as I will uh, show you. Uh, I mean, there are good solutions out in the field, but remember, it's always cost, power, performance, complexity. Where are you in that spectrum, right? Um, and if you really want to understand, like across the stack, this uh, retrospective paper that we, we were invited to write a couple of years ago with my PhD students, and you can read that as well if you're interested. But the major takeaway here is breaking the abstraction layers between components and transformation hierarchy levels and knowing what's going on underneath enables you to understand and solve problems. Basically, if we, cannot, we cannot easily understand row hammer if you don't know what's happening, and we cannot easily solve it if you don't know how to solve it. You can see that there are a lot of solution directions. But the trade-off analysis requires actually uh, a lot more understanding. So this should be 2020 and 2021, let's say. A lot of things, other things have happened. I'm not going to talk about this more, but row hammer is getting much worse, meaning uh, as the technology scales, as the size of the memory cell scales become smaller, and they become closer to each other, this problem is actually becoming much, much worse today. So in this paper, uh, we showed that you can cause these bit flips very easily after only 4,800 hammerings. That's very small, actually. Okay. Industry has proposed some solutions. So some folks actually, very interesting, some major manufacturers, major DRM manufacturers said, we manufacture DRM chips and they're all timer free. They basically said this. And they advertise their chips that way. We questioned that assumption. We basically said, are they really row hammer free? Let's test it. And we basically showed that they're not row hammer free. You can basically circumvent the protections that they put in their chips that they claim to be completely secure. We basically show that they're not secure. You can actually easily, well, relatively easily circumvent it if you know what you're doing. And people who really want to get to someone else's data, they know what they're doing, basically. There are a lot of smart people in the world. So what the mistake of the industry has been is they basically claim this is hammer free without saying, without trying to make it fully secure. So if you if you have a security problem, you have to prove that it's secure. Uh, it's, you have to prove that your solution is secure. And they didn't do that basically. They just said, oh, okay, we did something. We solved the problem without any proof. If you prove it, and if you do it in a, a nice way, then maybe you, no one can circumvent it. But they didn't do that as a result. It doesn't work. So it's very difficult to guarantee row hammer free chips. These are some of the results from recent, very recent years, as you can see, this was the work that you did together with Microsoft. It's very difficult to, you have a chip, you get a chip. It's very difficult to say whether it's row hammer free or not, because we don't know how to test it good enough, basically. And then actually, uh, there are many dimensions to row hammer. It's, it, it's affected by temperature, for example. It's affected by different access patterns that make it worse or better. I'm, I'm gonna leave it at that. And it will up solutions are actually very, very poor. So in this paper, uh, we, we showed that uh, industry adapt solutions can be completely, almost completely reverse engineered. So industry says we solved the problem, but you can completely reverse engineer it and actually make it much worse. And this is what we did actually in this work with FPGA boards that you will see in the next part of this lecture. We basically showed that all of the modules that we test are vulnerable because we developed a detailed understanding of how the underlying hardware tries to protect against row hammer. And essentially, almost 100% of the rows experienced at least row, one row hammer bit flip. So it can cause these bit flips in the entire memory. And error correcting codes don't work, basically. At least the way we're employed in industry today. OK. And there are solutions that we propose that I'm not going to go into. But this is one solution that we proved the security of. But again, it has, even though it's fully secure, it comes with complexity cost. And you could argue that we have to pay that cost to actually be secure. And I agree with that, actually. You have to pay the cost to be secure. If you say, oh, I don't want to pay the cost, then you're not going to be secure, right? So this is a choice that people need to make going forward. You really need to pay the cost to be secure. But the takeaway is, if you have an intelligent control that detects these access patterns, uh, you can solve the problem. But that intelligent com controller comes at a cost. OK. Uh, so you can find more detailed lectures on Rohammer, And we actually give lectures. This is a very a uh, compact lecture that talks about row hammer if you're interested. Maybe I'll mention, I'll give you examples from the human uh, life also. 
I guess some people know who this person is, Abraham Maslow. He's a famous American psychologist. He basically dedicated his life to understanding why human beings do the things they do. Human motivation, something we should really understand a lot better these days. Uh, but basically, he's very famous for uh, this hierarchy of needs, right? If you look at this, uh, he basically says you have to have your lower level needs, like physiological and safety needs satisfied before you can think about highest forms of abstract art, for example, right? That's my analogy over here. That's why everything depends on reliability, safety, and security. You have to first start with that. And I think this is true in computing as well, right? If you don't have a computer that's dependable, that's reliable, safe, and secure, or in other words, robust, then maybe you're not going to be able to do anything with that computer going forward. You have a lot of security holes, right? Or someone will take over and you will not be able to own that computer anymore, potentially. I liken this to infrastructure that we have in the world. This is a bridge. How many people know where this bridge is? <laughs> this gives some side channel over here. Uh, it's a Tacoma Narrows Bridge close to Seattle. It doesn't exist anymore because this is what happened to it, a bit flip. And this is a very famously studied uh, bridge actually. Uh, Basically, you have this critical infrastructure. Human beings have been building bridges for thousands of years. And this is, we consider that as critical infrastructure for thousands of years. But I would argue that it's not as important. Yes, this is a safety, security, and reliability problem. But these things are everywhere. Bridges are not everywhere, right? So these things are today the real infrastructure going into the future. Of course, we should protect these as well. But it doesn't make sense to not protect these. So that's the idea over here. So I will ask you this question also. These folks are constructing a city. How safe are they? Well, it depends on the bit flips they have on that road, right? If, if you have bit flips on that road, they may not be very happy in a second, right? So it's good to think about security and safety, about preventing unforeseen consequences. It's not about preventing what you know. Okay, these are things that I know may happen. Let me prevent that. Yes, you should definitely prevent that. But you should go beyond. What can you not foresee? How can you design a system that's robust in the presence of what you don't know. Yes, this is speculative right now, but this is really important going into the future because these systems will live for decades. That's why I think this quote over here is very important, I think. Okay, that, that's a question basically. Can we really depend on computers? And if you want to depend on your computer, like this person, Mr. Bean depends on his self-driving car, maybe they need to be much more robust going into the future, right? Because as I said, this car will be employing these algorithms that we keep, as you have seen in the last uh, seminar, Sean Lee, that we keep trying to perfect. But if you have bit flips, those algorithms are useless. Right? That's the idea. That's the takeaway over here. If someone basically can induce bit flips in your computer, or if these bit flips happen uh, because of some reliability concerns like Rove Hammer or some other reliability concerns, your algorithms may be useless. And this is. Uh, this, this should be taken seriously. Okay, so two other goals of this course is really to enable you to think critically. The reason I'm giving you these examples is not because I expect you to understand everything in the examples. At least you should get the gist of it and you should really start thinking critically, right? Okay, I've designed the greatest algorithm, but what is the weakest? Link? Maybe your weakest link is in the hardware down there that's executing the algorithm, right? If you don't solve that weakest link, it doesn't matter what you do at the algorithm level. Or maybe you should design algorithms that are tolerant to what's going on in the hardware. The hardware throws you bad bits. Well, you design the algorithm, it still works with bad bits. It's a tough task, but it will prevent you, uh, it will enable you to be much more robust. Right? So that's the critical thinking, basically. What are you missing? It's not like what you know, it's, it's really what you don't know, or what, what's the weakest link that really limits you in design. Okay, and also hopefully enable you to think broadly about systems and everything in general. Okay, so let me give you some retrospective about Rove Hammer. So this is very interesting because this, this, these bit flips, these, you can call them simple bit flips, who cares, right? But this, it enabled a new mindset that enabled a renewed interest in hardware security attack research. So real memory chips are vulnerable in a simple and widespread manner. And this causes real security problems. And there's a connection between hardware reliability and security. It's now mainstream discourse. So many new Romer attacks are being developed, actually. You can find tens of them. More to come, I think, because this is getting worse. And many new solutions are being developed also. In fact, 
latest is going to be presented tomorrow in a major conference that's happening in Lausanne right now. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can take a look at it if you're interested. But we should, we should probably have principled solutions to fix this problem. And there are more solutions to come. Okay, basically, the key takeaway is general purpose hardware is fallible. It's in a widespread manner, and its problems are exploitable. And this mindset has enabled many system security researchers to look into other issues. Well, what else is problematic in hardware? Can we actually find those problems and exploit them and fix them? That's the idea. And to, to be able to do that, you really need to understand the hardware's inner workings and vulnerabilities, because everybody is vulnerable to this problem. You cannot basically, everybody using computers is at some level vulnerable. And two of the groups that discovered Meltdown and Spectre, we're not going to talk about Meltdown and Spectre. How many people know about Meltdown and Spectre? Okay, I think that's a good fraction. It used to be more in 2018 when it was actually widely publicized. But these are actually common vulnerabilities in Intel AMD ARM chips, for example, uh, uh, that enable you to leak information. You can get private data that you don't have access to, basically. And those were discovered by people who worked on Rohammer before. So you can see the impact of thinking in a way that says, oh, this is vulnerable. There's a lot of issues in there. Can we actually find and fix them? And there's more to come, I believe. There's a lot more to we can, we're going to discover going into the future in this sort of issues. OK, I'll recommend you the survey that we wrote and this lecture and move to the third mystery. So given that uh, we don't have a lot of time, uh, I'm, I'll finish the year. I'm refresh. I'm not going to talk about memory performance attacks, uh, but I will. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Any questions on Rohammer? Is it fascinating? How many people find it fascinating? OK, some people love it. That's great. <laughs> How many people find it boring? It's fine to take. Yeah, OK, not, not that many or people are afraid. Fine. Yes, there was a question over here. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, it, it needs to be basically, you need to go back to 2008, around 2008. Basically, you need to go back 14 years ago. Which is not good, right? <laughs> yes, one more. Yeah, that's a good question, basically. And people are trying to fix it generally, in general. Of course, at an application level, you may try to fix it. But if you're running with multiple applications in a system, you're still vulnerable, right? In an application level, you may employ fault-tolerant algorithms, for example, that can tolerate some of these errors. But you need to, be, uh, you need to know what you're doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you want to look at the application level, if all algorithms are the ones to really explore. Very good question, though. OK, one more. I'll take that one. I see. At the applications? Uh, yes, you can do that. Uh, but then within an application, you may still get these issues. And uh, that requires significant changes to systems today. Systems today actually try to use memory uh, most efficiently and compactly. If you try to isolate applications, then you need to allocate the applications memory separately from each other. But I like your thinking. <laughs> so I can get rid of the problem within, uh, across the applications. OK, very good. So I'd encourage you guys to think more about this, actually. This is, I think you can, maybe you can find a solution to the problem right? that nobody has thought of. As I said in the earlier lectures, don't think that you don't have the capability to come up with solutions. I think with critical thinking, with different thinking, and with a lot of hard work after that, of course, you can demonstrate better solutions. OK, let's go into DRM refresh, because this is related to Rohammer, and I think it follows nicely. Uh, this is an old, memory, an old system, this AMD Barcelona in 2006 or so. You can see that it has a CPU chip and a DRM chip, a well, DRM uh, module in this case. Yeah. So if you look at systems today, actually, especially high-end systems, uh, about 50% of the cost and 50% of the power is spent on the D memory, DRAM. And one of the reasons is because of the DRAM ref refresh. We're going to talk about that. So if you go into focus into DRAM, it consists of these cells. And these cells are essentially a capacitor, as one of your colleagues mentioned, and an access transistor. And data is stored in terms of the charge status of the capacitor. And Basically, DRAM chip consists of tens of thousands of rows of such cells. Remember the rows that we saw? We have tens of thousands of rows of these things. 
And each of them stores a bit. If the capacitor is charged, you get uh, a, a one state, for example. If the capacitor is discharged, you get a zero state. We will see this uh, later on also. So unfortunately, this capacitor is leaking. And the EM capacitor charge leaks over time. And the memory controller needs to refresh each row periodically to restore the charge. This is done in every, every system. So right now, for example, my phone is refreshing its memory. It's not doing anything else but refreshing its memory. So it's wasting power. Typically, uh, you need to activate each row every n milliseconds. And today, n is typically 64 milliseconds or 32 milliseconds. At high temperatures, because leakage increases, you need to refresh even more frequently. So there are many downsides of refresh, energy consumption, performance degradation, quality of service or predictability impact. And refresh rate actually limits how, 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 how big of memories you can build. So clearly, each refresh consumes energy. And whenever uh, you're doing refresh, you cannot access memory. Right? This, is all, this is a performance problem. This is also a predictability problem, because if you're doing a lot of refreshes and the program cannot access memory, it will be delayed. Right? And you may actually be annoyed because you're trying to do something and the memory is refreshing. So here's some data. Uh, well, before the data, let me give you an analysis of the problem, basically. I'm not going to do the calculations, but I'm going to pose the problem. So imagine a system with one exabyte DRAM. Today we have that, actually, almost, in supercomputers, two to the 60 bytes. Assume a row size of 8 kilobytes, two to the 13 bytes. How many rows are there? That's an easy question. You divide two to the 60 by two to the 13. So you get two to the 47 rows, right? That's a lot. How many refreshes happen in 64 milliseconds? Two to the 47, basically, because every row needs to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds. What is the total power consumption? Well, I don't know. I have to calculate this one. You need to multiply the number of refreshes with the amount of power consumed for each refresh. And then what is the total energy consumption of DRAM refresh during one day? Then you need to multiply that power with the amount of time, seconds, in one day, for example. So that's a good exercise and optional homework. If you get a brownie points from me if you do it, feel free to send me email, uh, send digital technique uh, email list email. But you will see that this is on the order of at least kilowatts. It's a lot, basically. OK, so if you look at uh, memory devices, as memory devices become denser, this refresh becomes a bigger problem. So with a 64 gigabit, this, you don't need to know the exact numbers. But today, we have devices that are as big as 16 gigabit chips. If they become denser, refresh becomes a bigger problem because you have many rows, more rows, and you need to refresh them. And the capacitors are even leaker because cells are smaller. So you spend almost 50% of your time refreshing. So basically, you can think of it as 50% of the time, you cannot access memory. Similarly, 50% of the memory energy is spent refreshing. So this is a big scalability problem into the future. As cells become smaller, and as more cells are there, you need to refresh more. OK, then the question becomes, how do we solve the problem? And this is where I would like to spend some time, basically. Uh, the observation is that all DRAM rows today are being refreshed, right? The critical thinking is asking this question, basically. Do we have to do this? And this is probably a good question to ask. Not many people have done this critical thinking, but we should do this sort of critical thinking whenever we see something like this. And maybe if no, What's going on? You can actually answer this question positively, uh, meaning uh, saying that, no, we don't need to refresh. And that's the idea over here. So OK, let me give you one example of the critical thinking. If you look at the retention time profile of DRAM, it looks like this. So this is all of your cells. And this is how much they can retain data for. So most of the DRAM can retain data for more than 256 milliseconds. Only a fraction of the cells have to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds. So this is the distribution, basically. This is what the distribution looks like. An overwhelming majority of rows do not need to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds. But today, we're refreshing everything every 64 milliseconds. This is a physical phenomenon. Why do we have such a profile? Because manufacturing is not perfect, basically. You have all these cells, tens of thousands of rows. Not all cells are exactly the same. Some of them are much leakier than others. And some of them are much stronger than others. And this is called manufacturing process radiation. This happens in every manufacturing. If you manufacture cell phones, not everything is exactly the same. There are some differences between them. Uh, if you manufacture cars, there are some differences, basically. It's not perfect. Manufacturing is not perfect. Especially manufacturing at nanoscale levels is not perfect. When you're putting a capacitor that's on the order of nanometers, like less than 10 nanometers, then you actually get a lot of variation like this. So that's why you have this profile that I showed you earlier. Make sense? OK. So now I've given you, maybe you can take advantage of this profile, right? Assume you know the retention time of each row exactly. What can you do with this information? 
Who do you expose this information to? How much information do you expose? First of all, how do you gather this information? Is another question, actually. I didn't ask that. How much information do you expose? Do you expose the retention of every single road to the software, for example? Clearly, this information exposure exp uh, affects a lot of overhead. Uh, I'll take five more minutes, and then we will take a 10-minute break, and then Altabarak will continue. Uh, you, clearly, you can see that it's, uh, this information is a lot, actually, because you're, we're talking about billions of cells. It could be more in future generations. So how do you determine this profile information? And also, who determines this is another question. So this is an across-the-stack problem also. So devices have this manufacturing variation. Can you expose it to the higher levels? Even the programming language, potentially, right? That makes programming harder. But think about it. I'm going to give you one example. Uh, this is basically the observation. Uh, basically, the observation is that overwhelming majority of DRAM rows can be refreshed much less often without losing data. And this is real example from real data. For example, if you do not refresh uh, rows every 64 milliseconds, but if you refresh every 128 milliseconds, only 30 rows lose data. Basically, only 30 rows go wrong. Not bad. You can fix that some way. If you refresh every 256 milliseconds, only 1,000 rows go bad. It says cells over here, but take that as rows because they're randomly distributed across the chip. Basically, you can cut the refresh rate by 4x, reduce the refreshes by 75%, by in, uh, producing unreliable rows, only 1,000 unreliable rows. That's, that may be doable, right? That's the idea over here. Maybe the operating system can fix it. I don't know. So the question is, can we exploit this to refresh, reduce refresh operations at low cost? I already said this basically. Only 1,000 rows and 32 gigabyte DRAM we need to refresh every 64 milliseconds, but we refresh all rows every 64 milliseconds. So if you see a picture like this, then you should question. Say, okay, maybe I can do better. And the key idea that we did in a work that we published 10 years ago is to refresh weak rows. These are weak rows. Some, some rows are weak. They need to refresh more frequently. Some rows are strong. They need to refresh less frequently. Refresh only the weak rows more frequently and everything else less frequently. And that gives you a lot of performance improvements. I'm not going to go into the details of how to do this. You can actually, if you're interested, this paper is really easily accessible. You can read it. But basically, you need to identify the retention time of DRAM rows. You need to basically store this information somewhere. And there's a clever mechanism called bloom filter that does it. How many people know about bloom filters? Oh, no one? OK, maybe I'll have to introduce it in a later lecture since we don't have time today, because it's something really important. Maybe you'll learn about it later. Uh, but basically, you have DRAM. You uh, figure out this information and expose it to the memory controller. And you can do that with very low overhead using Bloom filters. Since we don't have time, unfortunately, I have backup slides. If you're interested, you can take a look, or earlier lectures in the past, or the lecture that I mentioned here. But we won't have time to talk about Bloom filters. And the memory controller refreshes rows in different bins at different rates. That's, that, that's simple, basically. And let me give you the results, basically. If you do a, a simple idea like this, it sounds very simple, right? And I think it's very simple, actually. Hardware cost is low. Refresh reduction is almost 75%. You can actually extend the idea to reduce the refreshes by more than 90% too, but hardware cost increases. Uh, DRAM energy reduction is 16%. And when DRAM is idle, like now, for example, I can reduce the power by 20% here. And performance improvement also comes. Basically, it's an idea that improves performance as well as reduces energy. This is the sort of idea that we want going into the future, basically. We don't want performance with a lot of energy. We don't want lower energy with huge performance losses. We want something that improves performance as well as improves energy efficiency at the same time. Yeah, this sort of idea makes a big difference, basically, in general. And benefits actually increase as DRAM scales in density. You can watch this. But for example, in future DRAM, the benefits are much higher. The energy reduction is 50%. The performance improvement is almost 100%. Because future DRAM is a much bigger problem. These results that I show you over here is to today's DRAM. But we always design for the future. 10 years down the road, what is the impact of an idea, right? 10 years down the road, the impact is much bigger. So the takeaway, again here, we broke the abstraction layers, right? We said, I'm refreshing something every 64 milliseconds. Should I really do that? What if I break the abstraction layer and say, look at the cells. These cells don't need to be refreshed that much. Actually, most of them don't need to be refreshed that much. So let me break the abstraction layers and understand what's underneath so that I can solve this problem. And this is the paper, if you're really interested. And there are further readings as well and detailed lectures on memory refresh. And if you want to learn about bloom filters, we actually talk about bloom filters in this lecture. But unfortunately, I don't have uh, time for that right now. I can take a quick question on this. Any thoughts? Is there a way to fix the problem in a better way? 
Okay, one more. So exactly, that's, a, that's another different thinking, basically. Today we refresh the entire chip because the memory controller doesn't know which memory is allocated or not. And that's a very good, another question, right, basically. Uh, if, if memory is not allocated, why are we refreshing it today? It should not be done. The problem is today, it's this information, whether a piece of memory is allocated is not communicated to the memory controller. Even though the operating system knows it, it doesn't communicate this information because there are no communication channels. But if it's communicated, you can fix that problem also. And there are actually papers that propose that. Yeah, it's this sort of critical thinking. Maybe there are other wastages that happen, right? Or maybe some of your program, some parts of your program are actually, uh, you don't care how much errors you get. And there are, there, are, there are some parts of your program that are tolerant, actually. And if, you're, if the errors you get by reducing the refresh rate is not a lot, maybe you reduce the refresh rate on those parts of your program data. That's another th way of thinking, right? That way you're breaking the boundary between the hardware as well as the program that you're designing. Maybe language, programming language has actually ways of actually enabling this information. Okay, any other burning comment, question? Otherwise we'll take a break. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break right now and then we will start with lecture, I guess, 3B. Okay. Maybe you can use that one over there. Yeah, that's more charged. That's Take the search. Okay, hopefully nothing is affected. We can guarantee that. Okay, is it working? Okay. <laughs> Actually, can you mute yourself? Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to mute.
Hello? Does it work? How do we understand? I just someone can say something from Zoom. Or, or write, write it in chat. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you on Zoom. Okay, cool, cool. Perfect. No, no, I use this one. Would you like to see the chat screen? No. It's okay, right? When I, when I was using it. Because somebody complained on YouTube, that's it. It's not working very well. That's it. Okay. It's fine. It can stay there. Needs to go first. Okay, I think you're upset. Well, I'll put it somewhere. Where were you sitting? Uh, over there. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll go somewhere else, like here, and let's see. Does this work? Don't know. Okay. Can you hear me? Maybe not. And you're, how it's is your, working right now. people uh, are uh, seeing it? Yeah, people okay, are good. seeing it and they can okay, hear Okay, let's get started. I don't know why it's not working, but, so what we're going to do in lecture 3B is, uh, Otabark will, Otabark will introduce you to the labs and FPGAs, what you're going to do the entire semester in the lab assignments. And then we're going to also, uh, you can you can reduce the yeah I did okay you did okay yeah. uh, and uh, basically a little bit about FPGAs also you may not understand everything about the introduction to FPGAs since we're going to start covering combinational logic tomorrow but FPGAs are uh, execution engines that you're going to use real hardware that you're going to use in your labs any questions before we begin I saw a hand somewhere but maybe okay yes. This mic is not working, right? Is, is this working? How about that one? Is this not working also? Somehow that is working. Okay, it's working. Okay, you can only use one mic at a time. All right. Should I get started then? Yeah, go ahead. yeah okay. So thank you, owner, for the introduction. I'm a first year PhD student in uh, Professor Mutl's group. And I'll start with logistics for the uh, labs uh, lectures. So the on-site labs will take place in these uh, rooms that you can see over there. And you can find more information about these in the DDCA course catalog webpage. And we will also hold online sessions for the labs. And uh, we will share with you how, like the details on how to join those meetings later. And these lectures are taking place at these time slots and you can learn more about these in the uh, course catalog webpage. Yeah, uh, I'll talk about grading. So you will get, uh, you will ha have to um, go through 10 labs and you will get 30 points in total. And we will put the lab manuals online before each lab, before each session. And you can see them on this uh, link over there. Now about grading policy, you will be evaluated based on your in-class perform uh, in performance and 70% will make up that uh, in-class evaluation. And uh, you will be also evaluated on the mandatory lab reports that you need to submit. And that will make up to 30% of the uh, point you get from a lab. And it will be a one point penalty for late submissions of the reports. And we expect you to finish the labs within one week after uh, they are announced. So if uh, we announce a lab next Monday, you will have time until next week and in the session that you selected in the uh, model, basically. And you can use, I mean, you could use your grades for labs from past years until yesterday night, I think, on model. And this was, the, okay, this is not updated, but you, I mean, some of you did. And for questions, you can um, um, send us emails to this mailing list, or uh, you can use the Moodle forums that we will uh, create per lab, uh, per assignment. Okay, any questions about the logistics? No, cool. So uh, what we will learn in this, in these lab lectures. Uh, so these will focus on uh, design space and trade-offs in these three layers. So you're uh, familiar with this transformation hierarchy from pre previous lectures, right? And we will understand how uh, a processor works underneath the software layer. And to do that, we will touch on implementation details um, at these three levels of the hierarchy. And uh, we will gain hands-on experience 
and digital circuit implementation. Yeah, in the, in the end, uh, you will learn how to make trade-offs uh, between performance and overall complexity of your designs in your hardware implementations. And you will learn this by gaining hands-on experience on uh, hardware prototyping on field programmable gateways or FPGAs, which we will describe in the upcoming slides. You will debug your hardware uh, implementation to find out the bugs in your designs. And then uh, you will uh, learn how to express hardware using hardware description languages. And you will be familiarized with the hardware design flow, the fundamentals of hardware design flow. And you will also learn how to use computer-aided design tools uh, to develop designs on FPGAs. So let's continue with a brief introduction to FPGAs. And FPGA is short for Field Programmable Gate A. And this is an FPGA chip. Uh, they usually look like this. And what you see here is an, is an integrated circuit also, or a chip. And these uh, chips come in boards like these um, with a lot of different modules embedded on the board and they serve different purposes. So FPGAs are versatile, so they can be used uh, to enable many different applications. And how uh, are they so versatile? Um, and the answer is because they're reconfigurable. So when you have an FPGA, you can program it after you've bought it, after it's been produced and com comes out of the fabrication, uh, you can still reprogram it to implement another hardware, different hardware. And that enables essentially the versatility. And in the lowest level, FPGAs have many uh, simple reconfigurable functions um, spread across the chip. And we have a means of um, interconnecting these, connecting these functions together in a reconfigurable way. And we can also connect these functions and the connections to the input and output, physical input, inputs and outputs of the FPGA device itself. Um, you'll see how FPGAs compare against other integrated circuits. And this slide owner uh, showed you in the previous lecture, so I'll reuse it. And uh, here, uh, the other types of integrated circuits could be CPUs, processors, general purpose processors, uh, graphics processing units, which will be covered in the upcoming uh, lectures, and uh, application-specific integrated circuits. So FPGAs would belong here if you were to put this scale down here. So to uh, to the left as we go towards the cpus we get more flexibility and it's easier to program as we get towards the asics uh, we get higher efficiency so fpgas compared to asics uh, will be easier to program develop your designs on but um, since the asic is essentially specializing um, sorry is using the whole silicon area to specialize for a single application and we won't be able to be um, FPGAs won't be as efficient as those because we're uh, uh, trading off some area for the configurability. And compared to CPUs and GPUs, we will be more efficient because we will be able to specialize for a single application compared to uh, this general purpose CPU that can run at uh, tons of different workloads. So uh, we will look at where exactly FPGAs are used in today's systems. And starting with this example, uh, this is Microsoft's project Brainwave as a deep learning uh, platform for uh, real-time AI inference on the cloud. And in this uh, uh, platform, Microsoft is using the FPGA to implement a, uh, what's called a neural processing unit to accelerate um, deep neural network inference. And they use this in computer vision and natural language processing applications on the cloud. Another example is Amazon's EC, uh, EC2, yeah, F1 instances. Amazon essentially has these computers on their clouds available for uh, people to rent and use them for a, uh, um, for a tempor temporary time, yeah. And interested customers will just rent these servers out. Uh, yeah, you can think of it as uh, a customer as someone that wants to run a lot of workloads on a lot of FPGAs, but they don't want to also purchase a lot of FPGAs. So they will just use Amazon's AC2 F1 instances to run their applications, run their workloads, get their computation done. And uh, from the bioinformatics area, this is another uh, use case. This uh, Illuminous Dredgen, Dredgen platform, yes. It, uh, 
it is a genomics analysis accelerator. It accelerates tasks like mapping and alignment, sorting, and uh, variant calling, which are critical in uh, genomics analysis tasks. And uh, more FPGA-based platforms have been developed before uh, for, um, again, genomics analysis. Researchers from Safari uh, collaborate in collaboration with uh, researchers from Bill Kent University developed Gatekeeper, the first FPGA-based alignment filter. And um, this accelerates a key stage in DNA read mapping process, which is pre-alignment filtering. And then they developed Sneaky Snake, which is an improved version, I get, I'd say, tackling the same problem again. And these uh, works have been published on bioinformatics conferences, as you can see here. And you can see many more insights into how FPGAs are used to accelerate genomics analysis. And this primary paper has been published on IEEE Micro. Now, uh, FPGAs are also used to um, accelerate other types of workloads. In this work, the authors accelerate uh, weather modeling, climate modeling uh, uh, solutions, basically. And here they demonstrate um, FPGA-enabled near-memory computation can accelerate genomics and uh, climate modeling applications significantly. And this is the, systems they're is the system they're using in this work. And they show that uh, this system can improve performance uh, from 5 to 27x and uh, reduce energy, uh, increase energy efficiency by 12 to 133x compared to a IBM Power 9 CPU, compared to a computer, basically. Um, beyond accelerations, we use FPGAs to develop infrastructures that we uh, ultimately use to test uh, different devices. In this case, uh, we developed SoftMC to test DRAM chips, DRAM devices, as a flexible uh, and easy to use platform. Um, and we have used it in many prior works to develop better understanding into DRAM reliability, security, and performance issues. And you can find the source code of SoftMC online on GitHub on this link. Yeah, a, a more recent version of the same platform has been used in recent works to develop further understanding into Rawhammer and how Rawhammer mitigations work, basically. And an even older version of the same framework, of same platform, has been used in the first uh, Rawhammer paper. Uh, to uncover that Rollhammer existed in a widespread manner across devices uh, that are available to public back then. And also discovered many other insights about Rollhammer. Uh, these are the recent works that I talked to you about in previous slides. Yeah, and uh, FPGAs are also used not only to test DRAM chips, but also other memory technologies, like in this case, um, NAND-based flash chips. And here you see a system, a, a an FPGA platform that uh, has NAND flash chips attached. And we use this to uh, understand, develop better understanding into reliability characteristics and um, of NAND uh, based, uh, sorry, um, SSDs and perform error characterization. And uh, we use FPGAs to uh, develop prototypes for new architectures as well. So in this work, uh, we developed PyDRAM, which enabled us to do real system evaluation of two in-DRAM um, computation techniques, uh, co copy and true random number generation. And PyDRAM is also open source, and you can find it on this link here. And we also developed uh, the, an FPGA-based uh, prototype for Metasys, which is an uh, open source, again, meta uh, metadata management system. And here we evaluate the system um, perform a limit study to understand the bottlenecks associated with general metadata management systems. And this is also open source and you can find it in this link. <laughs> uh, now I'll move on to the overview for, lab, for the lab exercises. And we'll start by looking at our FPGA board that we'll use in the, in the labs. So you can see that there are many um, inputs and outputs or um, peripheral devices that we can use that are uh, placed along the, uh, in, in different parts of the board, right? Uh, and these are all connected to the FPGA chip that's on the middle of the, the board. So you'll use this FPGA uh, at the end of the exercises to develop your first 32-bit uh, microprocessor and 
you will uh, download and you will run this uh, processor on this FPGA. And it will be a small processor, but you will be able to execute any program with it, pretty much any program with it. And each week we will have a new exercise and some of the exercises won't require FPGAs and we will get to those. And you're encouraged to experiment with the board on your own. So if you need a board, but you don't have it at one moment, you can ask us. It's unlikely that you will get a board because we have like limited number of boards and I think we have to distribute them all, but ask anyways. And uh, this is something you can take as a challenge but you cannot destroy the board by programming it. If you do, that will be the first, I think, in the history of the lecture. Yeah. But yeah, don't, I, yeah, don't try to do, destroy it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, first lab, in the first lab, we will draw a basic circuit, no FPGA involved. So comparison, you know, is an operation we use in software programming. Uh, commonly and we usually, because we usually want to know the relation between two variables. And we will compare two electrical signals in the first lab and we will output another electric, electrical signal that encodes the result of the comparison. So if it's equal, we will output one. If it's not, we will output zero, for example. Right? And yeah, no FPGA programming involved, but you can try it out later. In the second lab, you will uh, implement another common uh, uh, sorry, operation is called uh, addition. You know, uh, we will add two one bit numbers and uh, then, I mean, we will design the circuit that adds two bit num two one bit numbers and then we will reuse this to um, perform four bit addition. And reusing uh, hardware modules is really important in hardware design because uh, you can build on the simple things that you have um, build confidence on that you know that they're working correctly. So we will make sure that the one bit adder is working correctly and we will use that uh, adder multiple times to create another module. And uh, we will implement this design on the FPGA board this time and we will use the input, uh, we will use the switches as uh, encoding the operands of the operation and we will output the result of the operation using the LEDs. And in the third lab, we will output the results on the seven segment displays that you see here on the board. And you will learn how to encode the values um, that need to go be displayed on this uh, seven segment display. And you will learn to do that basically. In lab four, we will, uh, you will develop your first finite state machine. And this is gonna simulate a, the blinking, uh, sorry, harsh turn signals and you will blink basically LEDs. Um, and to maintain that state uh, for the finite state machine, we will use uh, memories. And then in the lab, we will also change the blinking speed of these uh, LEDs. In lab five, uh, we will implement what's called an ALU, uh, arithmetic logic unit or ALU. This is gonna be the first step towards implementing your very first microprocessor. And ALU uh, is an important part of the CPU because it, is responsible for doing these computations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and logic operations like AND and OR. In lab six, you will simulate the design that you developed in lab five, and you will comprehensively um, verify that it's working correctly. And you will resolve problems that um, exist in your design if they do. In lab seven, uh, you will write assembly code um, yeah, for the MIPS, ISA. Here are two examples of the same uh, program. Basically, this is written in C, something like C, and this is the MIPS assembly. You can think of assembly as writing code using only the instructions of the ISA and not something high level like uh, C. And this code will be doing, uh, yeah, you will be using this, uh, you will run this program on the uh, CPU you, de you develop in the end of the lecture. And this will be doing some image manipulation uh, tasks. In lab eight, uh, this is gonna take two weeks. This will be covered in two weeks and you will learn how a processor is built in just two weeks. Uh, complete your first design of, the, of a MIPS processor. And you will then run a SNAE program which will develop this beautiful pattern on the uh, seven segment displays. And in the lab, uh, last lab, I think, you will 
improve the performance of your processor that you developed in two weeks. Uh, and you do that by adding new support for multiplication and bit shifting operations. Okay, uh, any questions about the labs? Okay, you know, right? I, yeah. Uh, so the question is, do we need a, a Windows machine to program the FPGAs, right? And I don't think you need it. Uh, basically, you can use either Windows or Ubuntu machines. And if you're uh, attending the labs on site, uh, you can use the computer. Uh, you can use the computer rooms or the computers in the lab rooms to use the Vivata, basically. But uh, it's really tricky to get it. Get the software we need running on a Mac. Uh, I think I haven't tried it. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So yeah, uh, we talked about what FPGAs are briefly, but. Um, this didn't uh, this should, doesn't didn't supposed to be an anim animation here. Sorry, so we call that FPGA is a reconfigurable hardware substrate, and where it uh, where it's placed in this flexibility efficiency spectrum, right? So they are reconfigurable, and that's why uh, they have some they can support being efficient and also are easier to program compared to ASICs. And now uh, we will try to understand how that's possible. So uh, how is the reconfigurability? implemented, but at a very basic level. Uh, so this is an overview of an FPGA. You can see that it's uh, made up of uh, logic blocks, switch blocks, and interconnects, and some IO blocks. And these are already configurable, meaning that we can um, freely route from one logic block to another logic block using the interconnect. Um, there are two main building blocks in an FPGA, uh, lookup tables and switches. So here's a different depiction of the FPGA that we looked at in the previous slide. Um, here on the left, you see how lookup tables and uh, switches are distributed on the FPGA. And in a lookup table, we have what's called a multiplexer. This is a digital uh, circuit element that we will cover in the upcoming slides. And uh, there's something called configuration memories, some flip-flops or uh, memories to store the state uh, and manage the state if I need it. And if you look at the bottom right corner here, this is um, the distribution, I think, in an area uh, for the interconnect and the configuration memory and action logic, meaning the multiplexer. So you can see that the interconnect takes up a huge space here. And yeah, we will be freely uh, able to route from one, uh, from the output of a LUT lookup table to another uh, lookup table's input. And this, this way we implement uh, functions in the FPGA. So how do we program a lookup table? This is an example lookup table. It has a three bit input and that's why it's called three lot, three lot. And uh, you can see that we have the input bits here in red and output will be one bit. And what this does is it picks from one of the boxes. These boxes are a single bit, uh, basically each one of these is a single bit. and uh, to do that selection, it will look at these input bits. So based on what the input bit encoding looks like, we will select one of these. And this is called the data input. This is called the select input. And if the select input is zero, and there are three bits here, so it's zero, 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 we will pick this first box. So whatever is whatever stored in that uh, storage unit or data input will be output uh, through this multiplexer. So if it's one, uh, we will pick the first one. If it's two, three, four, you get the idea. And uh, we say here that uh, a three lot can implement any three bit function. And we will see over an example and you will probably understand why that's correct. Um, and we will try to implement a function that will output a one when there are more than, uh, when there's more than one ones, okay. When there are at least two ones in a three bit input, when two of the bits, at least two of the bits are set in a three bit input, this will output a one. So if you were to program uh, this in C, you could write something like this. Basically we're iterating over the over all bits of the input. Here this operation, what this operation is doing is it's selecting a bit. And then uh, when we shift it by one, 
we will in the next iteration select the second bit and in the last iteration we will select the third bit and if the bit is one we will increment this count and if count is larger than one we will return one another way to implement this in c is like this so we are enumerating every um, case where the output will be zero so there will be less than uh, uh, or equal to one set bits in the three-bit input uh, you can see it here, like if, if it's zero, there are no set bits. If it's one, there's only one set bit. If it's two and four, there are only one set bits because of the binary encoding. And uh, we will return zero in that case, and otherwise we will return one. Uh, so programming this in a lot looks more like the second uh, implementation in C. So we have already enumerated what the input the select input bits can uh, look like here. And what we will do is just move this return value to these boxes such that it will return the correct value. It will implement the correct function. Um, here you can see that we will input, like put zero in this first box, zero in the other uh, two boxes because there's only one set bit in the input you can see here. And here there will be one because there are more than one set bits. And we'll go ahead and fill, on, fill up the uh, remaining boxes. And this is how we implement a function basically in a lot. Uh, any questions about that one? It's not too complex, I think. Okay, cool. Um, so how do we implement com more complex functions? How do we implement the processor? Um, there are many uh, lookup tables and switches in an FPGA and this, uh, diagram I showed you is just a simple, uh, simply a very small part of the whole FPGA chip. So we have a lot of small lookup tables. They can individually implement different functions. And then we can uh, reconfigure the interconnect to make them work in unison to implement a more complicated function. Uh, in modern FPGA architectures, just so you get the idea of the scale, uh, you use many lots, thousands of lookup tables with six bit inputs. So we can implement any six bit Boolean function using one of them. And there are megabytes of distributed on chip memory to uh, hold state, to store state, maintain state. And there are hard coded, uh, by hard coded, we mean that not reconfigurable specialized blocks that are responsible for interfacing with high, with high speed memory devices and low latency high bandwidth off chip IO devices and many more basically. And even sometimes a general purpose processor will be uh, integrated into the same FPGA chip. And here's an example for such a chip. Uh, this is the Xilinx Zinc Ultra Scale Plus. And uh, you can see here that on top of the programmable logic, we have two CPUs and um, memory controller, some accelerators for cryptographic um, workloads and some other like units that are responsible for other parts of the system. Okay, so we will talk about the advantages and disadvantages of FPGAs once again. So we talk about how uh, FPGAs enable reconfigurability and that's why they're versatile, but it comes at a cost. We will talk about the advantages first. So since we can implement in, in any algorithm directly in the hardware, directly in the FPGA hardware, we're not bound by any ISA, so we can specialize for that algorithm and this enables um, high performance and high energy efficiency compared to CPUs and GPUs. Uh, compared to GPUs for some workloads, let's say. And this has also low development cost compared to a cost custom hardware design because uh, when you think of it, FPGAs are something we can, I, I could have here and program it immediately using my um, laptop. But uh, to develop Cerebras wafer, wafer scale engine, I need to do more basically. And compared to ASIC, this is much easier to develop. And it has also a short time to market because uh, it's reconfigurable, reconfigurable in the field. So if I have an FPGA, I can already implement a new design on top of it. And it's usable and reusable for many purposes because of the same reason. So imagine I have an outdated hardware that's running on many of the systems that I have. I want to update it. So what I do is just reprogram the FPGA with the new hardware. Disadvantages are compared to the wafer scale engine or ASICs, these won't be as, as efficient and as um, 
as fast and as power efficient, basically, because uh, we're sacrificing some of the area for reconfigurability, whereas those ASICs don't. And reconfigurability comes at another uh, cost. It also has significant latency overheads. So you will rarely see that FPGAs exceed some uh, high clock speeds. So it's really hard to see an FPGA that has a high, like higher than one gigahertz clock frequency compared to your CPUs, which reach in these days is around five gigahertz clock frequencies, right? Um, okay. So we'll talk about how uh, we program FPGAs now. We talk about them being programmable, but we don't know how to program them. So we'll use what's called computer aided design tools for that purpose because FPGAs have many resources and there's no way for us to program them manually. So imagine you have millions of lookup tables and how do you re uh, route one output to another input on your own? Uh, you can't. And these computer aided design tools are interested in answering these questions. So how can we represent a high level functional description of the hardware structure using FPGA resources? This is describing the translation process from the uh, Verilog code to FPGA resources, like lookup tables and switches, and select which resources to map our circuit to. Okay, I know that my circuit will require this many lookup tables, but where exactly are those lookup tables located? Where should they be located? And optimally configure the interconnect between the selected resources. So how do I lay out the lookup tables? And how do I route the connections in between them so that I get the best uh, latency area, the, uh, different uh, constraints. And then finally generate the configuration file so that the FPGA is able to understand and configure itself based on my design. Uh, so this is another look at the design flow. So uh, first we start with the problem definition and then we have to convert this. Uh, we have to find a solution and convert it, uh, express it in terms of a hardware description language. So this can be Verilog or VHDL. So you will use Verilog. In this course, there are many other hardware description languages, but these are the rather popular ones. And your task will be this. So you will write Verilog code for a, to solve a problem. And then there are uh, steps like logic synthesis, uh, placement and routing, and bitstream generation that I talked about in the previous slide. And this is automated by uh, the software tool that we're going to use, Xilinx Vivado. And finally, you will uh, use the bitstream that's generated by the Vivado tool to program the FPGA and run your own hardware on top of it. Um, yeah, more about Vivado. Basically, it's a software tool that helps us draw the FPGA design flow. So you can see here, we have run synthesis button, implementation button. These are responsible for the last uh, three stages of that uh, flow in the, uh, in the previous slide. So we just need to press buttons for those and uh, it's automated. Um, and it provides multiple tools to simulate, uh, for us to simulate our designs and understand the bugs and solve them. Um, and it also provides drivers for your computer and uh, a nice interface for you to easily program the FPGA board using USB cables. And they're installed in these rooms. Uh, so you can use those. And finally, we have a tutorial on how to, I mean, this will briefly introduce you to writing Verilog code and uh, following through the FPGA design flow steps using Vivado and, and then finally download the bitstream onto the FPGA to run your hardware. Um, and uh, this is gonna be, this demo is about a simple keyboard. It's a simple hardware that in the end of the course, you will be easily able to develop compared to the microprocessor, this sounds a bit more uh, lame, I would say, but yeah. Um, and link to the source files of this keyboard you can find here. So if we, uh, I think we have time. So maybe I can play this video and then I'll voice over when uh, in, the, in, the, in the key uh, section. So is it playing right now? Yeah, uh, in this demo, you will see how we program a BSS3 FPGA board with this demo, the simple keyboard demo. So this is the Vivado's uh, user interface. You will press this create project button to create a project and the metadata about the project, like project's name and where it will be created. You will fill these in. 
um, and then press next, right? M multiple times. And you get to this uh, window, the part selection. This is, this, this, this is where you select the FPGA so that the tool is able to understand what the FPGA is going to program and do the flow steps correctly. Um, you will select this part. You don't need to memorize it. We'll provide the part number to you in lab manuals and in a written document. Now we're downloading the uh, source files for this keyboard demo, demo on this website using the link provided in the previous uh, slide. So there's a zip archive here that you can find when you visit the website and you download that. Again, you can view this video anytime you want. So you, know, you don't need to memorize every step. So uh, adding sources, source files using this button and then we select design sources, right? And then we find the um, very, uh, files with the Verilog extension, that V extension. Those are the source files, and then we will add them to the project. Now we will also add another uh, source file. This is going to be an, and this this file has an XTC extension, which is uh, short for I don't know, but uh, it is defining how we map the inputs and outputs of the top level of the Verilog design that we have to the physical inputs and outputs of the FPGA. And once we have those, we can go ahead and click this button, generate bitstream. And this will basically schedule the tasks for Vivado that needs to be done for us to get the bitstream. So it's running the hardware design flow right now. It won't finish this quickly, um, but when it finishes, you can plug in this micro ESP cable here to both power on the FPGA and then to connect it to your machine that runs Vivado and where you have the bitstream located. Once you connect this, Vivado will understand that it, the computer is connected to a, um, an FPGA board. Yeah, uh, this is what you should see. If you don't see that, please let us know uh, when you power on the FPGA board. Um, yeah, you connect this USB cable to be able to, oh, this is for the keyboard, yeah. So you will open the hardware manager and then click this button, open target, auto connect, and then you will load the bitstream. You will load the bitstream, yes. Now, yeah, you do that by selecting program device. Yes. Okay, now the device is programmed. Now it's a, uh, it is the, the demo program loaded on the FPGA. And here we connect to the FPGA over that USB cable using a serial interface. And once we press the buttons, we will have some output here. Uh, outputting the ASCII codes for that for those buttons that we pressed on the keyboard. So this keyboard is plugged into the FPGA for this demo, uh, in case you missed it. Okay, this was it for the demo. Uh, and we covered these today. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions. This is where uh, the slides end. If you have any questions, I can take them now. Okay. Oh, there is a question somewhere. Right? There an okay, yes. Do you get a link for the soft? Yes, yes, we will share those details with you. Uh, over Moodle, I think. We will find a way. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, can you repeat? Sorry. Oh, yeah, so what in-class evaluation means is you will have to show your work to the TA, basically. And you have uh, time until next week's uh, session to do that. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, you can do that. Once we distribute those FPGAs, you can uh, take them with you. The problem is uh, you will have to share it with your partner, and you will need to find a way how to do that.
There's also a question on Zoom. Um, yeah. So do the students take the online labs receive a basis three? Maybe you can read it. Uh, maybe, I, yeah. Although the students taking the online lab receive a basis, basis three, no, uh, yes, they do. Uh, they can come, uh, we will, we will uh, announce pick updates, FPGA pick updates for everyone to come to the ETZ building and take an FPGA for. Okay, any other questions? Can people hear me? Okay, I can, I can yeah. do yours then. Yeah. Thanks, Let me make a, yeah, you just make a comeback. <laughs> All right, Atabarak is going to be the head, one of the head TAs for the labs. But before we finish, uh, let me show you that if you didn't understand anything about, for example, uh, the lookup tables, we will start covering things like this tomorrow. So you will know exactly what this circuit is, for example. It's a lookup table, <laughs> as you can see. It's also called a multiplexer. It basically selects one of the inputs and you will see that uh, tomorrow in the combination logic lecture and we will build an entire processor starting from components like this actually we will start a little bit lower level we'll start with the transistor and then build up these logic gates but this is called a multiplexer that's used as a lookup table so you will see it tomorrow uh, i'll see you tomorrow take care I don't know. How do we...